Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tech webinar series, our endeavor to empower techies. With the belief that sharing of knowledge is the key to enhance our skills and grow us as professionals. With this principle in mind, we have initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight of various domains. The topic of today's session is online and in-store retail strategies of retailers. Our guest speaker today is Mr. Pradeep Ganesha, Senior Manager, Program Management at Sapien Nitro. Mr. Pradeep has 13 plus years of experience in the software industry with many years of experience on program management roles. He is currently the Indian Execution Lead for one of the largest ATG based multi-channel digital re-platform engagement and has managed other e-commerce projects at Sapient in the past. Pradeep's career in the past spans across BFSI and retail verticals and, and has played various roles in technology and project management fronts. So without further delay, I introduce you all to our guest speaker. Over to you Mr. Pradeep. Hey, good afternoon everybody. Uh, so is the PPT visible right now? Let me put my screen just in. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I have uh, put up the screen, let's put up the slides for today's session. Uh, to begin with, uh, uh, let me uh, briefly call out in terms of what we are going to cover as part of this session. Uh, let me quickly get to the agenda part of it. Uh, before we, I get to the session, the agenda, so the reason we... Uh, uh, Mr. Pradeep, I would like to interrupt you. We are not yet able to see your slides. Can you please click on uh, slide sharing again? Okay. It says, uh, okay, let me, let me try that. We can see your screen now. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, so let me uh, get started with uh, the agenda itself. Uh, the agenda covers a few things, but before getting to details of the agenda, the reason this was chosen is uh, uh, primarily to kind of uh, talk to, uh, primarily kind of share with the folks in the audience who are working in the e-commerce space in terms of uh, what are the recent trends in e-commerce and not just on the e-commerce side but uh, there are a lot of whole lot of things which are happening on the in-store space as in the relevancy of the physical store and how that kind of uh, maps into what the users uh, or what the customers are really looking forward to. Uh, so I, I'm primarily dealing with uh, the second part more and less of the e-commerce and uh, that's the intent behind the whole session. In terms of the agenda, I'll start with a few slides in terms of the current retail trends in terms of how the buyer behavior is and how the buying process has changed from what it was in the past. Uh, then I'll get to some of the online retail strategies which are uh, used by most of the uh, retailers in the current uh, scenario. Uh, so primarily we'll talk about the change in the strategy shift from what it was to what it is right now in terms of online. Then I'll talk about some of the themes uh, of online retail following which uh, I'll get to the uh, strategies to reinvent the in-store experience. Now, uh, the first part was more of the online retail part and the second is more of the in-store and that's where I'll spend a lot of uh, time on. And then I'll get to some of the concepts uh, which are on the virtual space, uh, which kind of uh, marries the online and offline world. So that's the end of the whole session. I'll spend close to about uh, 45 minutes to ask speaking about it and at the end we're we going to have a Q&A session. So let me get started uh, with the retail trends. Uh, so in front of you, uh, you can actually see a um, standard buying process which we would have all been familiar with in the past in the sense there's a standard user, there's a user who just uh, views a TV or print media ad, goes to the store, compares the various options available in the store. The user might probably 
or the customer might probably uh, go to two or three different stores and choose the best option which he think he or she thinks is uh, uh, to be chosen. So uh, and finally, the buyer buys and uh, aligns with the brand. So this was the uh, this was the buying process in the past before the uh, multiple media and channels uh, got into existence in the recent uh, in, in the latest decade. Now let me go to the following slide in terms of how the current uh, buying behavior looks. Right, so the buyer process itself looks rather than before going to the behavior. Uh, so the current process, if you see, there are a lot of avenues through which the uh, the buyer can actually get to know the information. He does a lot of things. He goes to the net, searches uh, in terms of the details about the product. Uh, he goes to the print ad and he actually sees the product there. He goes to another website and uh, uh, probably looks to the ratings, reviews, and things like that. He probably downloads an app uh, which is from a specific retailer and kind of uh, sees if there are any promotions out there. And finally, he might end up buying on a website. He might go to a shop and buy it or buy it from the various different channels. What I'm trying to impress in this slide is primarily that uh, it's no more a single linear experience, but it is an experience which involves uh, multiple uh, touch points with the customer. Right. So the, the unique challenge out here uh, for the retailers is to be able to give a seamless experience for their end customers across these different channels. If the end customer does not get a good experience on any one of these areas, uh, let's say there's a review which is put on the site, which on a specific site which is uh, not so good about a product, there's a good likelihood that uh, the bunch of customers are not going to buy the specific product. So how do they manage their brand across all these different uh, channels and the touch points to customers is, has been a big challenge. So towards this, let me uh, also add in some more things which is primarily in terms of uh, the buyer behavior part of it, which complements uh, the actual uh, uh, actual uh, way the buyer experience is right now. Uh, so the buyer behavior is around the uh, few common things. The first is uh, the buyer is actually wired as in there are multiple channels to which the buyer can actually uh, reach out to the end product. Right? Uh, the buyers look for speciality and differentiated products. As in, they are, they, since the amount of information is so much and the options are so many, they look towards what really uh, is differentiated and something special about a product and how is it different from the others to buy it. Um, next, of course, the pricing. This is the biggest uh, thing in all in terms of making a decision. And where, where do they get the best price? Where is the product available at the best price? So that is the uh, buying uh, part of it from the pricing perspective. Uh, the users are vocal about uh, their opinions as in uh, in terms of the ratings, reviews and, sh and uh, shooting up details in the customer forums. Uh, the buyers do make informed decisions given the amount of information they have. They do uh, a lot of searches and decide on what they would want to purchase. And uh, of course time is of essence as in uh, let's say they are repeat things as in the uh, the weekly grocery shopping. I mean, if it could, if it could be done from the access uh, with the maximum convenience, that is what is chosen as against uh, standing in long aisles at a specific store. Uh, so, so these are some of the things where the buyer behaviors are uh, turning towards. And around this, um, given the way the buying behavior has changed uh, from what it was, the retailers have to do things to be able to reach out to the customer. Towards this, uh, let me uh, get to the online strategy part of it first. Uh, a lot of this, I think most of us would have gone through being part of the journey with these retailers in terms of, let's say, replatforming their websites and whatnot. So uh, a lot of these will be familiar to you guys, but the, I'll, I'll cover these in a couple of slides. And I'll get to the more interesting part, which is the in-store strategy. So let's get to the online strategies right now. And start with uh, putting a theme in terms of the strategy shift. Uh, so the first box really states in terms of what it used to be to what they are uh, transforming into or many of them have already transformed to uh, in, in the current world. So initially there used to be specific channels as in let's say there was a dot com channel and then they added a mobile channel or, over it but then these channels used to be in its own silos as in let's say for example the catalog which used to be on a specific channel of a mobile might not have been the same as what it used to be on dot com and so on. Let's say I made a uh, taken the sale or rather made the purchase half on dot com and I went to the store and I wanted to kind of complete the purchase or vice versa 
could I do that? So there was no connected connection between these channels. So uh, that was the thing of the past. If you look at it right now, there are so many solutions out there in the market, and quite a few of us have been part of this in terms of uh, getting the uh, users, uh, get, getting these uh, retailers, getting to a multi-channel, multi-device strategy, which is all set apart of a single backend framework, so that they can easily extend the new features and add on new uh, channels and devices to their portfolio. The second point is about uh, talking to customers to social dialogue. So nothing new to state here uh, the, with the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world. Uh, they are no more sending just email blasts and just uh, telling to the customer saying, oh, you know what, go ahead and buy this. But it's more of a social dialogue wherein the customers talk between themselves and decide what they want to buy and kind of share the ratings and reviews. Third is we control the customer's control. It's more of, it, it's less of uh, the marketeers of the retailer kind of uh, controlling uh, what the buyers would want to buy to more of what the customers chooses and makes a decision and and the and the importance or the success of a product bubbles by the customers themselves deciding what should be the success uh, the fourth point is everything to everyone to niche personalized experiences so there's more of just not being like a, a trying to sell everything to everyone but it is more in terms of uh, uh, let's say giving speciality things to niche customer audience so that uh, uh, it, it really um, gives the customers the, the nicheness what is required. I mean, I mean to expand it, it's something like, um, let's say a large retailer decides to set up microsites for specific brands. I'll get to certain examples in the in future, uh, in the future slides, but this specifically states in terms of how they can um, focus towards a specific audience by having niche experiences. The next one is linear shopping experience to a continuous interactive, which is kind of uh, maps to the theme what I had put in on one of the previous slides, where then it's no more a linear experience, it's a, it's a continuous interactive experience across multiple channels. The next is campaigns to conversations. This primarily puts the theme of uh, not just having, uh, uh, not, not just running some email blasts or campaigns, but actually having conversations. Uh, with the customer. So the, the, the brands have to engage in a crucial dialogue, uh, conversation with the customers to eventually end up in a buy. So consumers are buyers to consumers are marketing media. So com the consumers are no more seen just as buyers, but they are the brand ambassador. Uh, uh, a consumer who is a satisfied consumer uh, is going to be a brand advocate uh, or he or she who is not satisfied may be a person who is going to do negatively to the brand. Right, so that is all about um, the customers as buyers. And the last thing is more in terms of the platform itself. So what used to be more of a built homegrown, built from scratch, uh, proprietary platforms is changed to open and responsive platforms. There are quite a few of the platforms in the market right now, uh, which which we which uh, um, which uh, vendors pick up and do the implementations for. So moving to an open and responsive platform to which you can plug and play new channels and plug and play new features is the strategy shift with the retailers are seen. So the green box on the right hand side is a lot of things which have already happened or in most of the cases happening in a few markets in terms of changing strategy from what it was to what it is. Right? So this, yeah, this, this slide is more to give a perspective. And I'm moving on to the next slide which uh, primarily states in terms of uh, uh, what are some of the key themes of uh, online retail strategies, right? So I've said what is the strategy shift. The first is the, uh, the in terms of themes, the first is the multi-channel aspect. Uh, now, you you um, you had just the dot-com in the past, and then the mobile came in, and now there are the tablets and tomorrow whatnot, right? So there are a lot of new kinds of devices of its own shape and size and its own convenience to end users who are coming coming by. Now, setting up platforms which are going to have the same framework, but it's going to support all these different devices is all about multi-channel and around that, there's a lot of strategizing to be done both on the technology side in terms of process side, and that's what many of the large retailers have done. Uh, if you go to any of the examples of, let's say, the big US retailers uh, like the Macy's or the Nordstrom or a JCPenney or a Target, uh, they have over the last few years have either um, pretty much embarked on a new replatforming or they have already completed a replatforming of their existing uh, uh, of their uh, past uh, e-commerce and uh, they have gotten onto new platforms which uh, embrace the multi-channel strategy. 
next is around the personalization as a theme. So personalization is uh, uh, primarily can be profile based personalization or behavioral based as in based on what the user has been searching through it kind of further personalizes and gives specific let's say product recommendations, specific cross sales and upsells and stuff like that. So personalization has been a big game changer in terms of uh, changing the conversion rate on the site. Next is the social commerce which is uh, primarily in terms of integrating with the uh, social media and uh, integrating with the ratings and reviews and stuff like that and uh, social apps like the Facebook apps which kind of feed in back to the website for, for sale. Um, then apps which are going to provide augmented reality let's say for like for example a user can take a photo of himself or herself and kind of try out a new cloth on the site and stuff like that. These are newer uh, which are coming in uh, uh, which, which make a, a lot of better experience to the users and then the social ads. So these are around the social commerce aspect. Uh, next is in terms of A-B testing or uh, this is this is a concept wherein uh, um, to explain it a little more, there's a concept wherein let's say uh, the, the marketers are primarily trying to, to test and see as in uh, which uh, specific marketing campaign or which specific uh, uh, personalization aspect is going to be a better win than the other, right? So let's say uh, I, to get, take an example, let's say I'm uh, buying a sh shirt on a specific website. Now uh, uh, the, the, the website might have some intelligence built in which says uh, if you're buying this shirt, by the way, this, this is the trouser you may want to buy. So there's a kind of cross sell which they might have a uh, rule put in. But uh, coming to A-B testing, what it says is uh, have a rule A which shows a trouser specific trouser and have a rule B which, show, which shows something else which is a, probably another trouser. Right? and see uh, which of these actually converts to a higher conversion rate in terms of sales and adopt that and show to all the users. So what it's really doing is testing the waters in terms of what really sells and actually adaptively changing the personalization and the relevance to the end users accordingly. So that's about A-B testing. Right? So next is analytics. So well, quite a few of the uh, large retailers have along with their uh, re-platforming their uh, their uh, online space, they've also taken in and uh, set up a lot of back-end analytics and sophisticated marketing tools which enable their marketeers to uh, be able to administer the uh, products to their customers in such a way so that uh, it, it, it translates to better sales. Right, so the, I've just listed out a few standard tools which are available and are, are, are kind of standard in the market like the Omniture and Core Matrix. So until here, what I dealt with is, is a lot of things which is known to uh, most of us in terms of what these big retailers are doing right now. So what I dealt with still now is what are the retail trends, how the buyer behavior is changing, and towards that, how large marketeers are kind of trying to adapt in terms of the strategy change. Uh, just to recapitulate, going back to the previous slide, from what the strategy was to what the new strategy is, and towards that, what are some of the key themes around which they are aligning uh, their efforts towards reaching to their end customers. Now that's what we did till now and I'll get to the more interesting part which is in terms of strategies to reinvent the in-store experience. Now um, why I would say reinvent the in-store experience? Uh, the reason I would say that is given that uh, given the amount number of devices, given the number of channels which are coming, now the real question comes for most of the retailers who had the in-store which is a physical store is what's the relevance of the physical store? First of all, the physical stores take so much amount of money to kind of have the real estate, uh, stock the inventory, and actually have a storefront with uh, quite a few of the their own uh, customer associates or the their own uh, people who are going to take care of running the shop. And ultimately, if if that's not really translating to a lot of sales, then what's the relevancy of that? Now that can be a straight question which can come to most of us. Uh, if you date back to probably a few decades, uh, there's something which happened in the in the U.S. and the Europe markets where there was this catalog, the physical paper catalog, which came in the 80s and 90s, and it was kind of ta talked about that that's going to kind of eat away or uh, move away the sales from the physical stores, and the physical stores will lose relevance. So there's a lot of talk which has been hacking around. Yes, the online is the place to be in, and the physical stores have no place, right? So given, given these various uh, thoughts or schools of thought, it, uh, it's one thing is pretty, pretty clear. Unless the physical store 
finds uh, finds its own place, and the reason why the customer should come there, it will lose its relevance, right? And towards that, what are these uh, mark, what are these different retailers trying to do, and where is the trend headed towards? Is what I'm going to deal with in the future slides. Right, the physical store needs to be, in terms of what it should be, relevant to its customers. It has to embrace technology and work seamlessly across channels, irrespective of online or offline. The experience should be seamless to the end customer. Uh, it has to play a complementary role, blending with online channels for enriched customer experience, and it, of course, needs to run with increased cost efficiency. So these are the challenges in front of the uh, in-store experience. Rather, let me say for the stores itself. And towards this, uh, I'm putting up a, a really important theme in, in the slide. What the answer to this is again e-commerce, but this e-commerce is not the online e-commerce as in the electronic commerce. But it's all about experience to the end customer, and it's called experience commerce, right? So the, the experience commerce is all about the customer would come to the store if there is a specific experience which makes a difference to the customer. Uh, compared to what he or she would have got otherwise, right? So the store needs to reinvent and be relevant to give this experience. And around that, I'm going to take examples in the upcoming slides in terms of what some of these retailers are doing across the world. I'll start with one of the uh, examples, um, which is the Apple Genius Bar. I think uh, quite a few of you who have been in the uh, been to the US might have visited the Apple Genius Bar if you have. Uh, let's say bought an Apple product, uh, you can see, uh, and if you've gone to a store to buy it, uh, you would have seen that Apple has divided its store into two parts. One is the place where the uh, where the actual uh, uh, products are marketed, and there's another place which is called as the Apple Genius Bar, where a set of uh, technical support folks who are there, uh, right out there, waiting to assist their customers in terms of um, fixing the devices. Right, so it's more of a support support uh, support uh, roles which these guys are playing, and they are there as part of the Apple Genius Bar. Now, why I took this as an example is um, if you if you look at it, um, uh, let's say there there's a buyer of an iPhone or a, let's say an iPad. Uh, not many of them are probably techies, right? So the people who are techies can pretty much pick up and start using it. There are quite a few of them uh, who are not really uh, having a technical bent of mind who are probably, let's say, 80% of the people who are going to use these gadgets, uh, find the initial few hours or the few days of buying a gadget that much more intimidating to be able to set up and personalize and start using. And that is what Apple found in terms of some of their surveys that their customers found that it was intimidating for them the first few days until they got used to it to use the product. What Apple thought is, can we actually set up this genius bar which as soon as the sale is made, uh, the user can uh, pretty much take it to the Apple Genius Bar and the technical assistant is going to walk through the uh, walk through the features of the specific uh, product in terms of what all capabilities can be used. Uh, and it's not necessarily after the sale is made, it can be before as well. And it can also help customize and set up the whole product for the user so that the user can walk off or the customer can walk off the store as a happy man uh, or a happy person, uh, having uh, seen through all the features and capabilities and is all set to start using it. Also, let's say a specific user has a tech problem instead of going through endless uh, calls and sending, uh, sending across the device and stuff like that, you can just walk into an Apple Genius Bar and get it fixed right there. So Genius Bar is a concept uh, where it makes a difference as in, in terms of setting up a touch point with the end customer by solving the a specific uh, gap which the customers used to have as an end experience, which is the first few hours, the first few days after the sale, when they face uh, difficulties or technical issues in terms of using the gadget or the product itself. So, and what I'm getting to is engaging with the customer and uh, giving them an experience is all that matters, and that's where an in-store really makes a difference. And this is one of the examples. Let me move on to another example uh, of a retailer based out of the U.S. and this is uh, JCPenney, which I'm taking. Uh, so JCPenney, if you if you've gone to the store, uh, these are uh, this is a large uh, departmental uh, retail store in the U.S. and uh, they have they have they have a very old store, probably many many decades old, and uh, most of the um, American uh, people know they know the store. So 
So, but but the uh, thing what they were facing is there are a lot of challenge from the other uh, retailers out there, and um, their uh, physical stores the maintenance cost was going high, and they had questions about the relevance. So, what the uh, what I put in the slide is actually uh, what his, what the recent uh, CEO of JCPenney has actually envisaged for them. Now, the guy is actually Ron Johnson. He's a person who was behind Apple Genius Bar, which I showed in the previous slide as well. He is to kind of shift the strategy towards catering to the niche experiences of their customers, which is around the specialty stores, which is, it is no more like a departmental store giving everything to everybody, but it will have a lot of small stores inside. And if you see the two screenshots which I have put, um, where Ron is actually explaining out there, wherein they will have something called as a town square and around that there will be a lot of stores and each of the store will be a specialty store in itself and uh, the user can or the customer can go ahead and buy the specific brand or specific uh, uh, niche item. So I can, I can, I'll go to the next slide out there which kind of has some screenshots of uh, their concept stores, what they're put in. Uh, like um, the, if you see there's one which is around kitchen items, there's an, uh, another around some specific uh, fashion uh, apparels and so on. So each of these will be sub-stores within a store. It is a store within a store concept where each store is a specialty store and it sends a differentiator and it gives uh, a specific reason for the customers to get into the store rather than saying, okay, I want to buy a specific pant. Instead, I want to spare, buy a specific pair of pants which has this specific brand or this specific specialty differentiating from the others. Right? So this is what JCPenney is trying to do in terms of in-store to reach out to their customers. So I gave these two examples to begin with. Now I'll get to uh, the next part which is in terms of uh, how uh, technology is, is, uh, is will be used or is being used in uh, quite a few of these stores to kind of uh, uh, make a difference in the store and make it relevant to the customers. The three uh, important technologies which um, all of us have come across with them pretty much used, uh, but uh, together makes a lot of difference are these three which I put in here. The first is RFID which is the uh, radio frequency ID detection. Uh, I put a sample tag out there as how it looks. Uh, the second is Wi-Fi which most of us have gotten used to using it. And third of course is the mobile which is ubiquitous. Right, so these three things together can be game changers for the install. And how is that? Let's go. Let's look at it over the next few slides. Right. So let's talk about the RFID first. Um, so RFID as a concept has been there for quite some time, as in at least uh, five to six years. We've all been he hearing about RFID for some time. Now, uh, what is the difference right now? The biggest difference is RFID as a technology has evolved over time and it has become, got to a price point of, of in the US let's say a few tens of uh, cents and in the India for example a few ten, let's say a few rupees uh, uh, wherein you can actually have a tag on a specific product and if it is so small an amount for the for a tag then the retailers can actually start using it. Now what are the advantages of RFID? RFID does not really need a line of sight as in uh, most of us, when we go to a store, right, and uh, go ahead and buy something, uh, there will be the scanner uh, which is going to scan the price and it's going to add to your uh, uh, bill list. Now, what RFID is, uh, does is it doesn't need this line of sight. It doesn't need the optical line of sight. So it, it can be in uh, a radius of, uh, let's say, 100 meters, where in which an, 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 a specific RFID detector can pretty much uh, read an RFID tag and know the inventory status. So what this does, it does a lot of lot of uh, things to the retailer. So the retailers do not need to spend a lot of effort sending their store associates and the store people going around counting the inventory, stacking up the inventory, positioning it the right way and things like that. So they go ahead and uh, let's say stack it out once and if you see the picture what I put in here, it's, I marked it as smart shelves. Um, so what the smart shelves are is at any point in time, let's say the count of the number of razors of Gillette, for example, which is on in the store, is available at a central location. And as soon as a, something is picked up by a specific user it, a, or a customer, it kind of uh, reduces the count. So there is no need for a store uh, associate to go ahead and probably check out in terms of what's the inventory, should that be stacked further, and things like that. So this reduces a lot of manual 
uh, labor or intervention which is needed. And the store uh, uh, assistants can instead uh, spend their time engaging with the customers. The same time which they would spend probably stacking up inventory could be spent on engaging with the customers, answering their questions, and walking them through around. Right. So that is one of the big change with uh, RFID does in terms of smart inventory management and reducing the amount of effort spent on managing the inventory. Right. So let me get to the next part, which is in terms of the wireless and the mobile. What are the advantages which is going to give? Uh, the first is uh, in terms of anywhere, anytime cashless checkout. So with mobile, we can introduce uh, cashless checkouts easily, uh, uh, wherein uh, this, the user need not kind of stand in a long queue at the end of the store to buy the specific product. Uh, there can be mobile devices through which uh, the checkout can happen at, at any place in the store. Right? So I'll go through some examples in the future slides. Uh, the second, the, I put quite a few examples uh, primarily out of the US in terms of Nordstrom, JCPenney, Walgreens, also in the UK there are Tesco and these other companies which have already adapted or are adapting to it and they are doing some of the trial runs in some cases in terms of enabling a mobile checkout within the store. So what this does is uh, reduces the amount of uh, time the store, uh, the, let's say the cash uh, register, uh, reduces the amount of time a customer has to stand in front of the cash register. It also reduces the number of people who are probably required at the cash register to be able to make the sale. Right? So this makes a lot of difference and it's of ease. Uh, next is the, lo the um, mobile provides location-based uh, opportunity to provide location-based ads. Let's say, uh, let's take a case, right? So let's say you're driving uh, uh, across a specific store. Let's take an example. Let's say Big Bazaar. You're just driving across and uh, you have a mobile app of, let's say, Big Bazaar, which is put on your uh, phone. Um, I'm just taking a, a case example. Right? It's not necessarily that Big Brother has an app right now, but I'm taking an example for you to uh, kind of think through this scenario. Let's say you get a pop-up on your mobile saying that uh, there is this discount running in the store, or, and you might just be interested, and you might kind of walk into the store. So it's more of as you get closer to the location, and there's an ad which kind of uh, prompts the user to be able to walk in. Right. So that makes a lot of difference. So companies like Nordstrom, which is an apparel store in the U.S., is trying this. Uh, there's this Walgreens, which is more on pharmacy, has uh, introduced some of the mobile apps and has tried this location-based uh, ads and promotions. And uh, there are a lot of these uh, mobile apps which are relevant as well. As example, uh, on the pharmacy side, for example, Walgreens has the prescription apps. Uh, let's say there's a prescription and you're it's, it's, a, it's a refill, as in you're taking it on and on. Uh, as a repeat thing, so if you just uh, take off an app, it gets delivered to your on your app, and it gets delivered to your doorstep. So apps like that, which are very relevant. And I put another example of an app. I'm going to go through these as as we go through future slides as examples. It's a sunglasses app by Nordstrom. I'm going to talk through these. So there's a summary in terms of how the wireless is, wireless and the mobile can uh, be a game changer in terms of cost advantages, in terms of how the stores can be laid out. And in terms of the end customer experience itself, in terms of solving quite a few of their pain points uh, uh, in terms of long queues or whatnot. Right, let me get to the uh, next part, which, which actually has a screenshot of uh, uh, the Walgreens uh, mobile point of sale, which is anywhere, any anytime checkout. Uh, so you can see that the uh, store associate is having a uh, mobile uh, checkout device and uh, Buyer just uh, just chose what he wanted to buy, and uh, that got uh, that was just uh, uh, scanned into the shopping cart into the device, and uh, the buyer pretty much gives a card, and it is the sale is done right there, and there's no need to kind of go and stand in front of a cash register. This is a kind of visual in, uh, example of this. Let me go to the next one, which is a mobile app, uh, which uh, Walgreens is planning to roll out. Roll out. Um, in fact, they would have uh, trial tested in few places already. Let's say you have this app on your phone, and you have the, your uh, regular shopping list. You just have your shopping list in the first screenshot, and then you you select. Uh, uh, you say, "This is what I want to buy." You know, where do I buy it? Uh, let's say you are driving in your car, and it, it pretty much says which is the closest uh, store, which shows, let's say, a red store, which is red uh, ball out there shown up, which is the closest to store, uh, which is for, to where you are, and uh, you can pretty much the app goes next and says. If you go to the next slide where I am showing up, as in uh, uh, which are the places within the store, it goes and shows the store layout, which are the places within, within the store where you can find the product, what you are looking for. So it has all those uh, points which are shown up. 
and let's say you get into the store and you walk into those places and pick it up. It's that much more faster and easier for you to do this, right? And uh, to take this a step further, there can be probably promotions which can start showing up on this app saying that let's say you went to the shampoo sale and you, start, you, you were about to pick it up. It says that if you're buying a shampoo, by the way, you can pick this up which is like get one, buy one free or whatever. So that, that gets to a lot of relevance at the point uh, to make the sale and, and that's what uh, this app is uh, trying to do. And this is an example of the Walgreens uh, uh, app. Uh, the other thing what I was mentioning, another thing what I was mentioning is a Nordstrom Sunglass app. Now this is a pretty simplistic app. What it does is uh, it takes pictures of uh, you while you're trying your sunglasses. I mean all of us, uh, most of us at least would have uh, tried a pair of glasses to buy at a store, would have tried different frames and seen as which one may, looks good on our face. Uh, so the, the, the real issue there is you would have tried one and you go to the second one and you might think, oh, you know what, by the way, the first one might have been looking better for me. So uh, one simple thing which can happen is, let's say there's a iPad which is in front of you where the photograph is taken each time you try something. And all you do is put one next to the other, compare it out and make the, uh, make the buy. Now, this is a pretty simplistic app, but it, it kind of powerful enough for the user to see the difference of what all he or she has tried and kind of make a choice. And, and it's that much engaging in terms of user experience. Right? So further, let me get to another uh, thing which is in the concept phase and it has been tested to as well. Now we talked about mobile apps, uh, we talked about um, mobile checkout. Uh, prior to that, we also talked about inventory management to RFID. Uh, now we'll talk about something else which is um, about uh, personalized shopping carts. Uh, well, most of us who've gone into a shop, a retail store or a grocery store would have seen the shopping carts which are the trolleys which you pull around. Now how about let's say it's a personalized shopping cart which has some intelligence built in. Let's say you have your card which is um, uh, which is for the store. Uh, you have your card which is uh, which is having your name and details as, uh, as a person. And uh, you swipe in the card to the shopping cart and it says that this is the purchase what you made last time. And uh, for this, more often than not, if it's grocery, for example, you might have a lot of repeat things. So it really gives you the path in terms of where to go in the store. And uh, let's say it's an electronic trolley, you can pretty much sit and the trolley takes you through the uh, places. Um, I'm moving to the next slide wherein, let's say you go and pick up a specific uh, item, you, the trolley itself has a, a detector through which you can add to your shopping cart, which will be a virtual shopping bag. And, uh, uh, you can act, the, the stores can actually do display of advertising uh, on this uh, terminal of the shopping cart itself as the user navigates to the various aisles of the uh, shopping store, right? So that gives a location specific display and it reduces a lot of cost in terms of advertising. The amount of time, the time, money and the real, real uh, uh, let's say artifacts as in uh, let's say coupons, pamphlets and whatnot which the um, retailers are going to spend on to kind of do this advertising and promotions. All those are kind of contained and all it takes is to make the advertising relevant at the point when the sale is made and has the best chance of conversion to a sale, right? And that's what can be achieved out of this, uh, um, this intelligent shopping cart out there, right? Uh, also the uh, way the stores can be laid out can be less cluttered. If you go to, let's say, um, if you have walked into a food world, I think, uh, or, or let me take the same name of Big Bazaar what I took, I mean you would have kind of seen the amount of amount of money they would have spent on holdings to show sale, what a sale clearance and 50%, 80% or 100% whatever and whatnot. Right? All that money need not really be spent uh, on putting up those big holdings and all that can make a difference is to kind of relevantly show the right promotion and the advertising display at the right point to make the sale. And uh, this makes a lot of difference in terms of cost savings and increases the conversions. Moving to the next, uh, taking the same concept of this virtual uh, or, or rather the self-assisted cart uh, uh, further, uh, it can introduce concepts of self-checkouts wherein the uh, checkout can be done uh, by uh, pretty much on the cart itself uh, by uh, uh, probably using your credit card and uh, you can put it into, you can check out on your own and there will be something called as the RFID deactivator. Now let's say these are all stacked in shelves using RFID technology. Uh, so before it is taken out of the store, there can be an RFID deactivator where 
uh, it is gets deactivated and your sale is complete. Right. So this uh, technology makes a big change in terms of uh, giving the experience to the end customer out here. It also offers a lot of uh, cost savings advantages and lets the retailer make uh, actual targeted ads promotions and do the right things for the end customer. Moving on to the next slide. Um, this is more in terms of another section of what I'm going to deal with. It is more of virtual concepts. Now, just to quickly recap what we dealt with till now is we started with retail trends. We talked briefly about the online strategies which are being used. And we talked about in terms of some of the in-store strategies what are being adapted. Uh, they, I'll, I'll further get into what else can be done in-store. And I've put a separate subsection for that called as virtual concepts. So first of the things which is already in operation, you quite a few might have heard about it, um, and maybe if you have ever gone to Korea, you might have experienced that as well, is uh, the uh, virtual store. And this is done by none other than uh, Tesco, which is a UK-based retailer, and it has its uh, subsidiary called Home Plus in Korea. So what they've done there is um, people who have been in, uh, let's say, in India in Delhi or uh, of late in, uh, in Bangalore as well, for example, there are these metros which have kind of uh, taken the mainstream transport for the masses. Now, uh, most of us go to offices in, in let's say, metros, as in, as in, let's say, in Delhi at least, and uh, hoping it's going to get so in Bangalore in the future. Um, so you might, uh, you start using metros, and uh, the, the, the time you would spend in office, uh, and, and let's say, get while getting back, let's say, on your way back, if, if there's something which is put up at a metro station, uh, which is a virtual wall, which is a virtual store, and that's what they did in Korea. If you see uh, the small screenshot that I put, as soon as you get on at your metro station from your metro, you can see a virtual, say, a large, a large display out there. None of those products are real. These are all displays out there. And what you can just do is uh, take your mobile phone and uh, 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 scan the QR code of that, and uh, that gets added to a shopping cart. Right? You do the purchase by just doing the scan. And on your mobile, you just go ahead and do a checkout using, uh, let's say, your credit card or you're probably using a PayPal account or whatnot. Uh, and and uh, by the time you reach home, uh, your uh, products are also delivered to your home. Right? It's that much more convenient. And uh, in fact, the return of what has actually happened is uh, they had an increase of sales um, uh, by about 130% compared to where it was in terms of their total sales. And they had the number of user base in terms of subscribers who are doing it, who are doing this go up by, uh, as in the number of customers itself went up by 76% from where they were, and the total sales went up by 130%. Right? The concept is really taking the store to the people. Right? So taking the store to the, uh, coming to the buying behavior of time is of essence, specifically for uh, repeat things like grocery or standard stuff. Can they really get to that place where it makes a difference to the customer in terms of saving his or her time and get to the convenience of getting it delivered and uh, getting in the path of the customer's home to get it delivered? And that's what this specific virtual store has done. right? And it has been a big success and uh, it's something which a lot of other retailers are trying to replicate across the world. And I'm sure, no wonder, within a few years, there's not something which you would, uh, I would be surprised if we see it in our own country in India as well. Getting to the next one, which is around a similar theme, which is what aided us, which is a shoe company, as in our sneaker uh, shop, primarily a sneaker shop, which has all the other apparels and stuff like that as well, has tried, uh, is about a concept called Adiverse. And what is Adiverse is, is a virtual wall, which is an interactive shoe store. And you can see the screenshots out there. Now, what is shown there is an interactive uh, wall out there where there are shoes shown or sneaker shoes shown and uh, the user can use that as a touch screen and scroll the different shoes and let's say select a specific sneaker um, on the right side uh, or the middle uh, middle you can find the picture which shows the details about the sneaker uh, all the things
um, or, or a store over, over the weekend and uh, you would have just gone in to see like hundreds of others like you who are there also shopping and let's say you found uh, a specific pair of dress which you would want to try on and you just go near the trial room and see a beeline at a queue of uh, 15 other folks in front of you. Now how much more frustrating an experience it's going to be for you to wait in the queue and probably let's say one of them did not kind of uh, match or uh, suit your size, you will have to get to the queue again to try another one. So what is supposed to be your uh, good weekend shopping experience time turns out to be a frustrating nightmare and we have all experienced that. Right, so how about let's say virtual fitting rooms uh, making its reality and uh, these uh, virtual rooms, let's say there are 10 of these big virtual mirrors or the virtual rooms which are put in in a store and all the person needs to go is stand in front of it and uh, uh, show this specific uh, panel chosen and it will try out, take a picture of you, try out on you and decide in terms of whether it makes, you can decide whether it makes sense for you or not. And that's about the virtual fitting room. It saves uh, real estate space and no more long frustrating waits in front of trial rooms. Let me get to the next one which is uh, in terms of uh, some of the other strategies. Now what I've shown here is the virtual uh, fitting room part of it. Now apart from the virtual aspects, uh, let me cover a few more strategies which uh, some of the retailers are trying out. Right? This is a departure from uh, the in-store strategies but this is more in terms of uh, what are the other things what these uh, retailers are doing in terms of concepts. There are few concepts which I have put in, not necessarily in specific order. The first one is called as drop shipping. Now uh, drop shipping is a pretty uh, uh, caught up concept in the western world and it's, it's something which uh, is catching up uh, out here in India as well, uh, wherein uh, a retailer does not really need to spend uh, the actual time in terms of uh, 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 or the space in terms of setting up and uh, maintaining the inventory but takes the sale and uh, forwards it to the customer, uh, uh, sorry forwards it to the retailer uh, to actually do the shipping to the end customer. So that is the concept of drop shipping. So there is no inventory holding cost and the manufacturer direct, directly sends out uh, the, the uh, specific product to the end customer. So that's the concept of drop shipping which is cost effective. Uh, the second concept which I wanted to mention here is in terms of uh, marketplaces and all of us are familiar with the marketplaces like the Amazons and the Ebays of the world. Yeah, so the Amazons and the Ebays of the world and these are called marketplaces. Uh, so what are connected marketplaces? Now there are these online uh, uh, offline connections. I mean, let's take an example of Tesco, right? So Tesco has a lot of physical presence as well as online presence but uh, Tesco is uh, also having uh, getting into the marketplaces as in setting up marketplaces like the Amazon wherein uh, there can be uh, other retailers who can subscribe and sell under the brand of the Tesco so that's about the connected marketplaces. There are a lot of retailers who are trying this and the Tesco is one of them, the pioneers who is trying this as well. Uh, next, let me talk about the pricing strategies. So in terms of the pricing strategies, uh, let me take an example of what Walmart, which is one of the biggest retailers in the US is trying uh, or, or has been successfully, uh, has successfully implemented. So it's about uh, everyday lower prices, right, it's called as EDLP, uh, which is, uh, it is more in terms of uh, for the, um, uh, for the uh, customer, it is uh, like uh, at any specific day, the customer gets in, uh, you get the best price. It's not like you have to wait for a promotion, you have to wait for a coupon or anything. It's everyday best, lowest price and that's a strategy which kind of makes a lot of difference to the um, uh, to the end customer. They get the confidence that they are getting the best price. So moving on to another one uh, which is in terms of uh, clearance sale. I mean there's a concept which most of us are pretty familiar with which is uh, uh, what uh, one of the large retailers in the US like JCPenney is trying wherein uh, it's about uh, having clearance uh, sales on specific days which is going to attract a lower price and hence the customers. Uh, there's also this concept of uh, door busters if you've heard it it's more of uh, there's this uh, specific time and a day during which uh, there's going to be uh, there's going to be a lower price on a specific product and that is going to be the product which is going to 
product which is going to get the customers uh, to the um, uh, to the uh, store and that will eventually translate to other sales. Uh, and another uh, one which I want to just mention is about the price comparison app which uh, Amazon has uh, actually rolled out. And uh, what this uh, price comparison app uh, is all about is let's say you are in a store trying to buy something, you just uh, scan the QR code and uh, you can pretty much uh, go ahead and search in terms of what's the price on Amazon. If Amazon has a better price, you can go ahead and buy it. So this is a game changer for Amazon which, can, which uh, has increased their sales to a large extent wherein uh, it's more of a price uh, comparison app. So these are some of the other strategies both the online and the uh, and the offline uh, uh, things are being utilized or uh, are, are being tried by the different retailers. So I, I wanted to cover a few strategies out there apart from the in-store and the online and that's what I uh, captured out there in this slide. So with this uh, I would uh, like to open the forum for uh, questions. Um, with this I would like to open the forum for questions since I've uh, gone through the various things. But let me, uh, before we get to the questions, let me just uh, uh, recapitulate, go back to the agenda and say in terms of what all did we actually cover. We started with the retail trends, talked about what the buyer behavior is. We get to the, we got to how things have changed from the buyer's perspective and hence what the retailers are trying to do on the online space and what they have actually achieved already. Uh, followed by, uh, we went to the in-store experience and looked in terms of what are the different things uh, which they are trying to do in terms of the in-store experience, wherein we talked about the three important Sorry about the um, uh, pause there. So we talked about the uh, strategies uh, in terms of uh, reinventing the in-store experience, which had about engaging with the customers and uh, in terms of uh, having a virtual uh, uh, stuff set up in terms of virtual room and the virtual uh, cart and uh, the different uh, examples of those. So these are the different things what I wanted to deal with in terms of what are the things which the retailers are trying right now and how it's going to change the way implementations are done. Uh, so that's what I wanted to cover as part of this session. Uh, let me now get to taking some of the questions. Give me a minute as I scroll to the questions. There's a question on how does uh, um, deals, coupons, promotion work in relation with seller in the buying process? Uh, you can uh, see promotions for card purchase or simply purchase. Let me read through this question. So there's a question saying that uh, who pays for the discount? Uh, I would say, I mean, see, if you look at it, uh, see, discounts are a way that the retailers are uh, using to kind of, uh, uh, you, uh, the retailers use to kind of uh, get the customer. But the, if you look at the price, there is always a cost price and there's a retail price. And uh, in between is the gap which they actually make the um, uh, make the uh, money, right? So discount is something where they are going giving a part of it back to the customer so that the customer comes back and buys. So it it really like uh, it's not like who pays for the discount. Uh, it is uh, pretty much uh, as in uh, how much the retailer can give to get the buyer back here, back to the store, right? So that's about discounts. Um, let me get to some of the other questions. There's a question on uh, can you give uh, uh, any strategies for a standalone store? Uh, I'm talking about uh, primarily grocery stores. So 
um, or, or other the huge retail stores. There's a question on can you give some of the strategies for standalone store. I think for the standalone store, the strategy is more in terms of how you can be a niche player. So as in what is it that you're going to give as something which is really differentiator and something special as a product and an experience to your end customer why uh, and that's why your customer is going to come to you and if you look at the strategies what I was telling about large retailers uh, what they were trying uh, was to kind of take on the uh, specialty stores or these small stores by being uh, differentiated to the customers and I think uh, what the smaller stores can do is is the real power what they have in hand which is the differentiation let's say you have a product which is niche, you have an experience which is niche, and that's what is your differentiator. Let me get to the other questions. How about backend systems placed to support these online strategies? Which are the leading or preferred backend systems in the market today? So there's a question saying, how about the backend systems and which are the leading backend systems? I think in terms of backend systems, there are a few things. One is uh, inventory management. Uh, then uh, there is the product information management or the PIM and uh, third is uh, in terms of uh, a system which has the customer relationship management and uh, fourth is uh, in terms of uh, doing the actual order processing right so if you get to the uh, uh, get to the uh, part of it which is in terms of product information management there are a lot of products which are there in the market out there uh, including things from the leading players like the IBMs and the Oracles of the world where they have PIMs or what they call they are called as where the products are really created and from there on comes to the online and the different channel storefront uh, then uh, apart from PIM uh, you have the inventory management system wherein again there are a lot of supply chain uh, uh, systems out there which are available um, which can uh, take care of the inventory aspects uh, which uh, of course starting from the SAP to uh, there, there are things like JDA and whatnot wherein you can do these inventory management stuff. Uh, then uh, there, there are some companies which have their own homegrown stuff as well developed for this. Uh, third in terms of uh, pricing and promotion aspects uh, I think uh, the platforms as in the digital platform or the multi-channel platform uh, uh, platforms which are being implemented pretty much have those as in you can take the big uh, big ones like let's say the ATG or the Hybris or the WCS from IBM so all these have pricing and promotion strategies which can be used um, apart from that in terms of order processing on the back end uh, there are the standard systems like for example Sterling Commerce which is one of the standard systems used wherein let's say the all the different channels from which the orders are taken are kind of submitted to Sterling Commerce and processing is done on the back end these are the various systems. There are many more, but I think in terms of key ones, these are the few things what I can mention. Let me get to other questions. Uh, there's a question on the virtual fitting room. What would be the technology investment cost? Has any company has rolled out a virtual fitting room? Uh, I think uh, virtual fitting room, uh, the technology cost uh, at this point in time, I would say, is the amount of technology investment uh, which has to happen to make it uh, actually work. Uh, it is still in a concept stage and if you ask have any companies uh, really rolled it out, it is uh, more on a conceptual stage where all these bigger companies like the Nordstroms have really tried it. Uh, but uh, the real uh, issue what they are facing is to be able to give that uh, actual experience to the user wherein uh, the fitment and uh, uh, the, the user getting that feel that uh, he or she has uh, got the right fitment and made the choice. Now, to that extent I think uh, there are these uh, 3D virtual reality and stuff like that where there are uh, trials which are being done. So this has not got really uh, gotten into mainstream but this is something which is uh, still in a concept stage and uh, as and when it becomes uh, real uh, I, I would say that is something which is going to uh, make a lot of difference in terms of the two points what I mentioned before. Uh, let me get to other question. Uh, there's a person who's asking, uh, does the user uh, mind paying extra tax bucks, uh, uh, tax paying in store when the product is available online after trying the product at in store? 
So I think uh, the, there's a misnomer or, or, or a uh, implicit assumption in this question saying that there are no taxes online, which is not entirely true. I think uh, online you might see that there's one price shown, but uh, there the, the retailer would have factored in all the prices and shows you as one price saying that there is nothing which is going to add in for you. But um, taxes are really factored in and whether it's online or offline, taxes need to be paid. Um, two other questions. Uh, there's a question, how can I pitch a merchant for online e-commerce store? So there's more of a question saying that, okay, I need to go to an offline merchant and say you have to go online, how do I pitch it? Um, I think it's, it's basically where you can show the um, store owner uh, and, uh, uh, the investment versus the return on investment. As in, if you look at the current uh, world, let's say you're an online, you're, you're a, uh, you want to set up an online store uh, with uh, many uh, open source systems available, it, it pretty much takes a few hundreds of rupees per month to set up an online store. And all that you need to do is uh, use one of the standard uh, uh, out of the box uh, open source things which are available it's for a, if it's for a small retailer and do some payment integrations and shipping integrations and uh, the store is all set up. Um, and, and the cost is going to be per transaction cost. So I don't think it, the amount of upfront investment is low, uh, is not very high, but at the same time it can be an additional stream of revenue for the uh, retailer. So I think that should be the primary going theme if you are trying to convince a small time retailer to go online. Uh, going to on to other questions. What is the social buying? There's a question on what is social buying. I think social buying, uh, apart from what I already covered, see, uh, the basic set of uh, things what I covered is, uh, let's say somebody goes from a Facebook app and kind of gets to a, a real store or somebody reads a specific review and through that uh, clicks on that and comes and buys. So that's, also, that's all part of the social buying. There's also other kinds of buying, uh, if you've uh, heard of concepts like the Groupon, which is pretty uh, uh, success in the US and there are quite a few of uh, sites which are trying it out here, wherein a group of buyers wanting to, let's say, buy a specific product. Let's say I want to buy a Sony Bravia LCD TV, which is like whatever, 42 inches or even bigger. So I decide to buy that. Instead of going and checking where the price is best, I put uh, my add myself as a person who wants to buy it. And then let's say there are five other use, uh, users, uh, customers who want to buy the same. You all group on through that site and uh, put a bid saying that uh, we are together willing to buy five TVs between five of us and what's the best price you're going to give. And then there are sellers who are going to bid for it and the lowest bidder is going to get uh, get the sale. So that's a kind of buyer-centric uh, buy, uh, buyer centric sale. Now that gives the best price for the buyer. So that is uh, also a part of social buying, uh, if you will. Moving on to other questions. How has uh, Facebook and Twitter changed the e-commerce is another question. I think uh, it was partly answered. So uh, primary thing is uh, as an end customer, whom are you going to believe, right? So do you believe uh, an advertise which comes on TV or are you going to believe uh, what the uh, seller is trying to tell you through different uh, means or, or are you going to finally believe somebody whom you already know or another peer who is trying to buy the same thing or has bought the same thing and has shared his or her experience, right? It's the latter as in you're going to really believe on an, a consumer who has bought it or had something to say about it and that's what the social commerce has bought into the into this uh, uh, fray. So, so, so it, it really changes the customer's uh, perception about a brand by knowing uh, the context of the specific product uh, from uh, the other users who have used it and that's what the social commerce has brought into, into play. So going on to other questions. I think I've pretty much covered most of the questions. Let me see if I missed anything. Uh, there's a question which is asked in terms of what is the option to explore or a well-guided system to for guided shopping. I'm not too sure I understand the question it's by an asker saying we. 
but I, if I try to answer that, uh, if the question is more of what um, are the different products available to give, let's say, guided navigation, I would say things like um, standard thing, uh, which is Endeka, for example, if you've heard about it. Endeka is a search engine, uh, search enabling uh, engine, um, uh, which is for large retailers, wherever you do large e-commerce implementation, uh, you would have Endeka search which is put in. A simpler one is the Google search itself. So Google provides uh, a search which is not not just the uh, worldwide Google search, but you can buy the Google search product and put it in within your site, which is going to search uh, for products within your site. And that's going to give a search which can be customized and has a lot of look and feel like Google, but it's limited to your site. Uh, that's another search uh, product which you can use uh, uh, if that was your question. Look at if I missed any other questions. I think I've covered most of the system questions. Um, yeah, I think I'm done with the questions. What I see. Um, and I'm done with the presenter. Uh, over back to the moderator. Well, thanks, Mr. Pradeep, for your session on online and in-store in retail strategies of retailers. It was indeed a great session. I would also like to thank all our participants for the support in making this webinar a success. The recording of this webinar will be available on techic.com by tomorrow. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.